I wonder, I wonder what you say either to yourself or to someone else in response to the question, how could God do this? Each of our lives includes an endless stream of prompts for that question. At every scale from global catastrophe to personal loss and pain, some that we hold so closely they may never even be spoken, my go-to answer to all of it has been, God did not do this. That answer has allowed me to lean on faith that would otherwise have been discredited in the face of tragedy. What kind of God would inflict such suffering? Why would I have anything to do with such a God? God did not do this. It's something I've said in one way or another to some of you and to many others in times of loss or misfortune or despair. Why me? Why now? Why her? Why here? God did not do this. I've gone so far as to describe to some of you the incomparable psychological value of that answer. If you blame God for your losses, for your misfortune, for your pain, to whom will you turn for solace and strength? Keep God on your side. Our God is a God of endless compassion. The cross, just one sign of the unfathomable depth of God's solidarity in human suffering. God isn't doing this to you. God is in it with you. It's a choice, that answer. It's a choice I made years ago. I heard an academic theologian question on the topic of evil, and he broke the question down in a way that laid bare the necessity of one choice or another, at least if we want to maintain the integrity of our intellectual coherence. And in brackets here, I will whisper that a warning against the idolatry of our intellectual coherence, but most of us hold it dear. What the theologian said was this, on the question of evil, and we may as well include all manner of loss, pain, trouble, tragedy, and strife, Christianity holds three propositions to be true, despite their being incompatible with one another. In other words, it's a paradox. One, God is all good. Two, God is all powerful. And three, bad things happen. You can only go all in on two of those. Pick any two you want, but you're going to find yourself finessing the third one. So I made my choice. I am committed enough to the reliability of my own sense of observation to hold pretty tightly to bad things happen in my interior world and in my exterior world bad things happen. And people who fudge this one say things like, well, it only seems bad to us, but from God's perspective, it's actually good. That's not me. God is all good is the one that opens the door to understandings like God is love and love is God. And no matter how we think or behave or pray, God loves us and all people infinitely and equally. I'm not, I'm not inclined to compromise on that one either. God is all powerful. Nothing happens outside of God's intention or control. Now there's a bargaining chip. I can give you back some of that. So I made my choice. God didn't do this. When we find Jacob this morning, we're more than halfway through his story. The strife between Jacob and his brother Esau that began in Rebekah's womb with Jacob wrestling his twin out of the way, continues when he tricks his father Isaac into giving him, Jacob, the blessing that was supposed to be Esau's. Jacob is sent away from the land God promised to his grandfather Abraham to find a wife. And it's on this journey, and we heard this a couple of weeks ago, that Jacob sees the angels of God coming and going. He ends up with not one wife, but two sisters, Leah and Rachel, and he ends up laboring for 20 years for his father-in-law Laban as he and Laban cheat and deceive one another, striving for the upper hand. And then God sends Jacob home. Genesis 31, verse 3, then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your ancestors and to your kindred, and I will be with you. The narration is characteristically spare. 
There are no literary fireworks to mark this turning point, but it has been 20 years of labor far from home. This is the hinge of the hero's journey. The Lord said to Jacob, return. And it's on the return home that we catch up with Jacob this morning. What happens is not exactly unexpected on the homeward leg of the hero's journey. Jacob is accosted in the night by a mysterious adversary. They wrestle all through the night, unable to prevail. The mysterious man, as the narrator calls him, cripples Jacob with a blow to the hip. He's not mortally wounded. He's not even, according to the tone of the narration, defeated, but he leaves this fight with a limp. So the adversary of the one on whom God has showered promise and blessing, the adversary of the one whom God has promised to accompany, this adversary does his worst but does not prevail. God is love. There are struggles in life, but God is on our side. Bad things happen, but God goes into them and through them with us. God did not do this. And then the biblical story swats my choice aside, announcing that, in fact, this was God. The same God who sent Jacob on the journey is the God who accosts him and wrestles with him and cripples him on the way home. And who am I to say that God did not do this? Can God not do what God wants? So here's where my choice collides with the ancient view. In biblical times, and not only in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, that choice that I described earlier was as easy as mine, but arrives at a very different conclusion. Bad things happen. This was much harder to avoid in a landscape of subsistence farmers and warring tribes. So they stuck with that one. God is all powerful, yes. To say otherwise is blasphemy, idolatry, and faithlessness, implying a threat to monotheism itself, potentially crediting false gods with real power. That was the thinking of the ancients. When it comes to God is all good, really? It was as easy, it was an easy choice in the ancient world. So in the story of Jacob's wrestling match, some scholars believe that even that in its earliest origin, the story may have followed a more predictable hero's journey. The adversary may really have been an adversary that Jacob or his literary forebear may actually have encountered a foreign god. But ancient piety ultimately rejected that narrative. It had to be God himself with whom Jacob strove. And when he does strive, with God. It's worth remembering the the relationship between striving and strife. In In our world, we often think of striving as positive and strife as negative, but those two things are one and the same. This question of strife and solidarity, or strife versus solidarity, inevitably leads us back to the cross. What is happening? Can God be against God? Can God who has promised to be with us, but but more than just with us, in us, God in whom we live and move and have our being, God whose life is in us in such an integral way that anything other than solidarity is nonsensical, unthinkable, can this God be the source of strife? along our journey home to God. Jacob is in strife with God, and in the midst of that strife, he says something astonishing. I will not let you go until you bless me. God has promised to be with us. God can be nowhere else, even in the striving. May we refuse like Jacob, to let God go. May we refuse like Jacob. May we refuse like Jacob to give up on the striving with God until at last it becomes a blessing. Amen.